This video is about uh, rebuilding your transmission it's all, when it's already in your bike. So one of the first things, uh, obviously, is to clean everything up real well. But um, these, make sure that these surfaces, you got to start out from here. These two surfaces here have to be in line with each other. So that may require undoing these four bolts. One, two, and there's two underneath. And this one here, you may have to jack up the motor a little bit so it allow this to float. But um, it's really important to start from square one and these two flanges have to be in dead alignment with each other. We've actually got a fixture that, um, a jig that we put it on and that actually aligns everything. But if you're in your home shop, you know, good straight edge will do the job perfectly. A common problem with these transmissions is this um, counter shaft bushing on the right hand side. It is uh, never really left a factory with enough interference fit on it. Uh, the OD on this is 1.250. I automatically make uh, our standard size 1.253. I should actually left the factory a little bit more clearance, but you, in your existing transmission, check that this one is tight. And most guys will just put their hand down there and sort of try and wobble it, but that doesn't do anything. That's not sufficient. So let's go around to the uh, right hand side of the bike. And um, what we do is we actually make up this jig, little drill jig, and we'll drill two one inch, two one eighth inch holes. And where those one eighth holes are is actually coming in to there and there. And we actually get a punch. We actually get a punch, and we punch on the back side. And we're going to check to make sure that they're that the bushing is good and tight. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Indian had a real piss poor sealing arrangement here. There's just a, a, a gasket that's set on the inside. And quite often these, this is a leak point. Uh, we put a plug in here. You don't have to drill anything. It's already got a big hole here. Just uh, get an eighth inch pipe tap. So it's one eighth pipe tap. And then tap this hole and get your plug and tap this hole. Uh, you're going to have to go backwards and forwards, like check the check uh, uh, the depth because you don't want this plug going too far in. It's just got to be flush with the inside of the uh, trans case. Otherwise, it's going to push on the end of the counter shaft, and that's bad. So um, you, you're going to have to thread it for a little bit, get your plug, check how you screw it in, check how far it goes in. Not deep enough tap it a little bit more but the last thing you want to do is go too deep on this one and then afterwards you can just get some uh, two-part epoxy uh, and uh, fill up these holes these two uh, holes punch holes and um, you're good to go you won't have any uh, oil leaks but this this plug here is uh, an upgrade that we come out with a long uh, a while ago and that way we don't get any chance of any oil leak because uh, if it does leak out of here with the stock setup, it's a major ordeal. You've got to pull the whole transmission apart to do it. And the likelihood of a leak out of here is extremely high. Need to check the fit of the inner, the inner primary over the snout of the engine and the transmission. Uh, sometimes these are a little bit too far in. And um, sometimes it's a manufacturing tolerance on the primary covers so what you can do is with the sanding gun just come in there and take some material off there don't get too serious just take enough little by little and come back and check the fit till it's just nice and snug like so Here we're going to show the installation of the generator drive bearing and seal and the inner primary cover, which is an upgrade from the original bushing. The original had a bushing in here. Um, you can actually see there's got a helicoil, helical uh, oil groove in there. Uh, if you do decide to use one of those, which you shouldn't, 
Uh, just make sure those grooves are going the right way. One of the manufacturers made these grooves the wrong way. This one actually shows it going the right way. What happens is, as the shaft is turning, it's pulling all the oil from the inside of the primary out. Um, so there's already quite a few people with, uh, with those installed into their primaries that are uh, experiencing oil leaks. It's quite a major job to redo it. You've got to pull the whole training apart to do it. But this is the bearing and seal upgrade. Uh, first off, we put a bevel on the inside of the hole and that uh, facilitates easy seal installation. But the bearing, there's two sides to the bearing. There's a radius, see a radius on here, and then there's the flat side. Always press against the flat side, never the radius side. We're going to press against the flat side of the bearing. We've uh, put some, already put some light oil on the inside of the bore. Now, don't ever tap bearings in, they need to be pressed. So don't be getting a hammer and punch or anything like that. Push down the arbor press, that's nice and flush with the top. It helps if you put a good size bevel, it helps lead in the, the seal and just press it in with an arbor press or a punch mandrel until she's flush. Originally Indian didn't have any gaskets between the uh, engine flange and the transmission flange um, about 20 years ago we come out with some gas it's only made sense uh, they just used a, a sealant maybe not even anything but it was a source of an oil leak so we come out with these gaskets since then we've worked with um, James gaskets to come out with a really really bitchin gasket this is a uh, foamet material maybe hard to see but it's actually a it's got a, a metal shim in the middle in the center and it's got a foamet material on each side really a bitchin gasket. Uh, these gaskets will actually take up imperfection in all parts. You know, over the years, the parts become distorted. Guys have used screwdrivers on them to part gasket surfaces, gouge them, which is which you should never use a screwdriver on. But um, they get a little bit serious over the years. So the nice thing about the foamet material is it's got a lot of conformability. So it'll take up a lot of those imperfections and fill those nicks and gouges with this material. Uh, don't ever use any sealant on James gaskets. So, the gasket on the um, transmission flange and the engine flange and then the um, inner primary will go on and we'll fit up the three screws next. The three screws that hold the inner primary to the engine and the transmission uh, must have sealant under their heads. That's really important, otherwise it's going to uh, leak out. The sealant we like to use is Yamabond number four. And then apply it to under each of the screw heads. And then fit her in. Just make sure you put plenty under it, clean it off afterwards make it look nice and neat. The countershaft bushing in the uh, right hand side of the transmission goes in a blind hole. And it's important that uh, the bevel, you see one side's got a large bevel on it, the other side's just got a small one. It's important that the one with the large bevel, it's about a 10 or 15 degree bevel on it, goes in that way. Um, what it does it facilitates for easy easier installation and it doesn't broach the hole always do this with the transmission warm ideally ideally it should be about 250 degrees 
but I mean that's hard to do um, when it's when it's uh, you're doing this in the bike. Um, just even real hot water can help out, or you can preheat it, the transmission. But um, it's got to be any time you're putting bearings, bushings into aluminum, you've got to preheat it to expand it. Otherwise, it just broaches the aluminum. Before installing main shaft bearings, make sure your cases are preheated. That's always very important. The right hand side bearing is sealed. The left hand side, being the clutch side, is either open bearing or shielded. Uh, when pressing or tapping in the, the uh, bearings, make sure that you don't apply too much pressure. It's, it's actually got a seat, seat up against this flange and if you get over uh, too carried away on it, you end up breaking the seat and then you've uh, got a ruined transmission. But, uh, we'll go around to the right hand side. Um, some earlier models have a different, uh, this is a later model, it's got a proper uh, bearing retaining nut and a seal. This bearing retaining nut actually seats the bearing, holds the bearing into place and it's a seal carrier as well. This is the setup here. If you do have to uh, tap a bearing in, you shouldn't really have a tap on bearings. Uh, it should be pressed in, but in this application, you know, you can't get a press into the motorcycle. We've got a, a spud that we made up. But if you've got to tap uh, a bearing into place, always tap on the outside of the race. Do not ever tap on here. This here. Um, technically you should not use a brass drift, you should actually use mild steel. Nothing hardened, not a punch, a uh, hardened punch, but uh, uh, um, something of mild steel. Uh, the reason being you use steel is one, it's, it's softer than the bearing race and um, it doesn't leave chips like brass. Brass will actually uh, chip and then it can get into the bearings the balls themselves. So this is the upgrade. This is the bearing retaining nut here. And this seal presses into there. And we've got another spud that presses it in just below these little installation uh, tool marks. And this is the output collar. The I always advise upgrading to the bearing and seal it gets a little close on uh, 39 and earlier models. I mean, the output is narrower. Sometimes you, before you even start, just do a dry installation of this without the seal. And um, sometimes you've got to come and lathe and trim this back a little bit. Always install the collar with some oil on the outside. It's a common mistake. People install seals dry. And what happens is you got rubber on a dry metal part, starts turning, and it actually fries the, it actually ruins the seal before you even start. Check the clutch sprocket studs are tight. Uh, these are riveted into the clutch sprocket themselves and uh, they do, once in a while, come loose. This particular one's got two, they come loose. Uh, what we do is we put the clutch pressure plate on top and it'll hold all these in its proper location and use regular nuts, don't use the jam nuts, but just use regular nuts on here because when we rivet it on here this is going to be, uh, the nut itself is going to be making contact with the surface and not the stud so it's not going to burr over the end of the threads. So, Put the nut on a good solid surface like this and with a ball paint hammer tap on the end of the studs and you'll have it all you'll be able to reclaim your clutch sprocket that way while at it check the clutch sprocket bushing these are notorious for uh, wearing out and they affect the clutch operation as well so the only one about a thou thousands clearance on that. Always hone the clutch sprocket bushing. Uh, a lot of people ream them 
but reaming leaves a coarse finish and that'll uh, lead to rapid wear. So always hone the bushing and we'll give it a nice fine finish. While at it, check the sprocket driver gear bushing for clearance, also known as the output gear. Uh, this one has to have adequate clearance on it, at least a thousandth and a half. Otherwise what will happen is this will lock up on the main shaft. It sort of sits high up in the transmission and it doesn't get a lot of lubrication. So clearance is really important here. There's two different setups for the cluster gear. You can either go with a stock bushing setup or our upgrade which has roller bearings. Uh, we'll discuss the um, standard bronze bushings is like so. It's got a helical groove in there. Um, a lot of people think that the, uh, the helical groove is to do with oil pumping through the oil holes, but it actually doesn't. It's just, um, it doesn't allow for edge loading when it's rolling, when it's actually running on its counter shaft. So it just uh, avoids the high edge loading. So that's actually the reason why the uh, the helical oil groove is in there. It's important that the bushing be flush at this end. It must be flush with the surface of the gear. It must not be sticking out beyond it. The, all the end clearance is done at this end. Is at the small gear and output side. It's important to do all the the end clearancing set up at this end. Otherwise, what will happen is if you if this is protruding out and you're actually sitting in neutral, the slider gear will actually and it doesn't take that much, a few thousands, and the slider gear will actually be rubbing up against this in neutral. Uh, this is our roller bearing. Upgrade. It's not a needle bearing. This is a roller bearing, which is uh, uh, far higher loading than the uh, a B series uh, roller uh, needle bearing. Needle bearings. This is an example of a needle bearing. It's uh, the B series, which has got a, a casing around it, and the, it's it's called needles because these are very small. They don't take much loading. This bearing setup here, the roller bearing setup that we come up with a long time ago and we tested this out extensively on sidecars because sidecars are really, really hard on bushings. They just start tearing this setup apart. This end here is extremely heavily loaded. Um, even when you're changing your oil on stock bikes, you'll know you'll see a constant uh, bronze color coming out and it's actually this end of the bearing that's just wearing away. Uh, it's so the setup here is one roller bearing this end. The output end takes two. It depends what gear you got. There's this spacer that'll go on this end. And or if you've got a, a stock type gear set up, this is the spacer that's used for that. So you'll use one or the other. Generally it's that setup there. And the way to get the end clearance is going to be with these thrust washers. It comes with a selection of thrust, thrust washers. So no matter what setup you got, you'll be able to accomplish your end float with that. Once the cluster gear bushing has been sized, or if you're using the uh, bearing upgrade, you have to set the side clearance on the cluster gear. This side clearance is to be between five and ten thousandths of an inch. This one here is rather excessive. So the uh, bushing on this side of the gear, this end of the gear, has to be flush with the surface and all the end clearance is done at the right side, the small gear end. First part of the transmission assembly is drop the cluster gear all the way into the bottom of the transmission. So don't put the countershaft in, you're just dropping the cluster gear so it sits 
all the way into the bottom of the transmission. Now inspect your splines, make sure they're in good condition. See these ones, this one here is like brand new. This one here has got a lot of use on it. The sprocket has become loose and it'll, you don't go ahead and use that one because it'll actually get worse and worse and worse. It'll just slog out. So make sure the splines are in good condition. Now put the sprocket driver gear through the bearing. A little bit of oil on the, um, on the gear snout itself and that'll aid it going in. And next up, put the collar on and put a little bit of oil on the collar so it doesn't burn up the seal. And we're going to put the sprocket and the nut on. And then that'll hold, capture all this over to the right side of the transmission case. We're going to be setting up the main shaft end clearance, so we want to make sure that everything's captured and locked in here nice and tight. When you're doing things, always double check your work. Here's a classic case where the sprocket goes on, it's tight, and you can see how much wobble and everything. You actually have a look in the sprocket driver gear, and that sprocket is and nut is on tight. So it's either the collar down here, may not be wide enough. Uh, this is somebody else's reproduction gear. Uh, it could be that, that it's uh, manufactured a little bit off. So always double check your work at every single step. So this particular one, we're gonna go back and measure the width of the collar. Hopefully it's just that, it's the problem. Apply some blue Loctite to the sprocket driver gear threads and then we'll go around the left side of the bike and we've got to lift the cluster gear up so you have to get your hands on there lift the cluster gear up and then drop in the counter shaft and the snap ring always make sure that that snap ring is seated properly it's very very important uh, these things, uh, we've seen them where they have not, the counter shaft will work its way out and uh, just take out your transmission. So always make sure that that snap ring is properly seated. We're going to align the clutch sprocket to the engine sprocket. Insert the main shaft, doesn't need any thrust washers on there. We've already done a pre setup on this, it's got a lot of thrust, a uh, lot of shims behind a clutch sprocket. There's actually a 60 thousandths worth of them, which is considered excessive. But in this case, the motor was built elsewhere using uh, probably import components. The drive shaft in here is really important. It has to fit, be within a certain spec. And if it's off, uh, made too long, it throws everything else off. In this case, the motor was set up wrong. It's got the wrong drive shaft. Uh, incorrectly made drive shafts, so that's where we end up having to put 60 thousandths worth of shims out here. So set that on so. Um, I can also tell I've had to double stack up thrust washers here. The engine, that goes in behind the engine sprocket. Uh, you can tell things that haven't been set up wrong, uh, set up right. Uh, you can see bluing like this which is in, set up with too little clearance, if any, or we didn't have any clearance at all. And uh, it's just uh, create, generated so much excessive heat. So we're actually, we're lucky in this case that we pulled down this client's transmission because the whole thing hasn't been set up right from the get-go. But for now, we're just putting the engine sprocket on, clutch sprocket on, and then we're checking the alignment. Indian actually calls for the alignment being done out here on these outer machine parts. Um, actually, I like to I like to do it across the teeth because the bottom line is it's the teeth that have to be in alignment with each other. Now you can do it either way, but if Indian mismanufactured something out here, it was ten thousandths off. Likewise here then it's going to throw everything. I'd like to do the sprockets because the bottom line is 
it's the sprockets that have to be in alignment with each other. It's an interesting little bit here from a previously rebuilt by someone uh, engine transmission. This master link, generally Indian uh, chiefs are an endless chain and actually there's no point in having a, a master link in it because uh, you can't put it in and out once it's in the bike anyway. So it's actually, a, you might as well just use an endless chain and it's one less thing to go wrong. But in this case, somebody's used a master link and hasn't put a link plate under here. So you can actually see how far it just goes backwards and forwards. And this thing here is just gonna be a catastrophic failure. Once this fails, it takes out the whole inner and outer primary cover. It just will blow it all apart. There's nowhere for it to go, so it just blows it all apart. So this is a really lucky finding. Uh, just always try and use an endless one. But if you do use one with a master link, it must have a link, pad, link plate like this underneath it. This way here, it is gonna fail. Put the primary chain on and we're going to check for generator sprocket alignment in the chain. This is a thrust washer that goes on the back, hardened. This sprocket has been re-riveted onto a new shaft. Always make sure the rivets are down the same level as the flange itself. Sometimes different manufacturers put too big a radius in the shaft, in the shaft diameter to the flange and it'll hold this thrust washer, thrust washer off the surface. So it'll actually be elevated a little bit like that. If that's the case, come back with a die grinder and then just grind a bevel on the inside of this. So it sits down there nice and flush right up against the flange. Make sure they're all seated and it's actually to be centered between the chain. There's uh, the thrust washer thicknesses are 090, 060, 030 and then we've got an 15 thousandths one as well. We've got to set the main shaft end clearance. There's a thrust washer that goes on this end and a thrust washer that goes here. Always put the thinnest thrust washer on here. What that allow the, allow the shoulder here to protrude out far enough beyond the output nut. Uh, we'll show you that in a moment. But um, this particular one, uh, we had to gang up two thrust washers at this end because it's got one of these Chinese or India made crappy drive shafts. The guy is uh, installed so we're having to work around that it's you know really wrong we've got the extra thrust washer extra shims 16th of an inch of shims stack up on a clutch sprocket so everything's moved out so uh, we're just chasing it all around it doesn't hurt anything but uh, you shouldn't have to do all this so you got a shim here or a thrust washer here thrust washer here slider in you got the clutch sprocket nut. Make sure that the flat side, got a flat side, it's actually a washer face. The washer face always goes against the sprocket. That's the open regular side. But this one here, the washer face always fits up against the clutch sprocket. Slide it over the main shaft. In she goes. Clutch sprocket goes in. And this is a special tool we made up. It's got double hexes in here that allow for fine adjustment. When we actually get the final final installation, we're actually going to use a hammer and cold chisel. As brutal as that sounds, it has to be tight. Otherwise, it will come loose. So if you use a tool like this, this tool is great for just general installation to get it tight. But the final tight has to be done 
with a uh, hammer and cold chisel and a lock washer under here as well but we're just using this for fitting up purposes special little tool we made up for checking main shaft end clearances, end float. So what we're looking for is between five and ten thousandths. Actually, probably cut this one down a little bit. We're about 11 on this one. Oops. The reason why you put the thinnest thrust washer, main shaft thrust washer, up this end of the main shaft, the right side, output side, is because this shoulder here is to protrude beyond the surface of the nut. It's really important. What you've got is you've got a kickstart cup washer and it sits on there and it's got to sit on that shoulder. If it isn't shimmed right in the transmission, this cup washer sits on the nut. So what happens is when you go to start the bike up, the bike starts up, the kickstarter usually stays down or either a bounce up and down and uh, it's called, you'll hear a bad clunking noise, that's the kickstarter, we call kickstart ratcheting. We have another fix for that, but whenever you're doing a transmission, always make sure that this shoulder is protruding out beyond this nut. Originally the engine sprockets had a cork in here. Whenever we do a motor, we upgrade this to a seal in here. It's a little bit hard to do it after in this case. But uh, the cork washer, I've actually um, found it doesn't do anything, so I don't even bother putting it in. I haven't put them in for 20 years and haven't noticed any difference whatsoever. Uh, you got to be careful with the cork washer because if you do use a cork washer, it actually has to be sanded down, so it's just proud of the surface of the sprocket. Otherwise, it'll lock up a motor. So for safety-wise, you're just better off not to use them. Uh, I've seen more more problems created from them than what it's worth. Apply quite a bit of sealant in the shifter fork shaft hole in this end. We use uh, Yamabon number four. But uh, be liberal with it, stick quite a bit in there. And shifter shaft goes in the hole. Shift the fork in the slider gear. Small gear goes to the left, clutch side. Slide it through. And before sliding it the rest of the way, into the, before sliding it into the hole, I put another bunch on the end and slide it into. That's hole. Tap her all the way in. Let's make sure it's tap it all the way in. Put the shifter fork plug in here, but before you do. Apply some uh, blue Loctite. Uh, it's really important that this does not come out. If it comes out, it, uh, it will get into the primer and jam everything up and lock up the back wheel. So it's really important. Use some blue Loctite. Don't have to use impact, but it still pays to Get it tight, and then with a dot punch, 
Well, stand up, aren't you? Do like so, and that'll double insurance policy, so that won't come out. These two 916 diameter ports here, these are what transfers the oil from the primary case area through to the transmission. So when you're pouring it in here, what happens is it goes down and then migrates through these two ports in the transmission. For that reason, it's important to pour the oil in slowly because what can happen is it'll back up and then come out the level plug out here and give you a false indication of it actually being full. So uh, some guys uh, separate the primary from the transmission. Um, I, I don't particularly like that. Today we've got synthetic oils, so um, it does actually a, a more than adequate job of lubrication to the gears and is still friendly to the clutch. So that's uh, utilizing today's synthetic oils. But um, if I've seen more problems with people separating the transmission and the primary. It makes the transmission oil level a lot harder to check. And a lot, it's real inconvenient, so therefore you don't want to do it. And what happens is you don't have the reservoir, so that you don't have as much in the transmission. Uh, if they're both common, you've got a reservoir out in this area. So if you've got a little leak in your transmission, at least you've got a quantity of oil to pull from in a primary that'll go over. But I've seen more problems where guys have ran into an oil leak situation, the oil level's gone down, and then they've fried the whole transmission. So always I highly recommend keeping these ports open and using a common oil between the primary and the transmission. And we'll get into the synthetic oil further along.